Okay, the clock on the wall says five o'clock. So we are live. This is AP Computer Science A. Um, day, starting to blend together. Day seven. We've got seven one day left eight. after today. Seven out of eight or six uh, out of six, zero six to out seven. Of, yeah, zero to seven, depending on how you look at it. Um, today is array, array list recap day. We're going to be talking about searching and sorting and all kinds of fun stuff today. Um, I'm Rob Schultz. And I'm Jill Westerlin, and we're so happy that you're here. Today, you're going to be really prepared for the multiple choice questions about searches and sorts, as well as some of the free response, and we're going to revisit algorithms. So what you're going to get from today has a lot of bang for the buck. Um, so get a pencil, grab a seat. Um, here is our map. Um, it's very exciting to see um, where everyone is, and you need to know that you are reviewing with all your, your – um, Virtual classmates. That's right. Virtual we are a classmates virtual and peers classmates. all around the place. Um, yeah. Cheering each other on from one side of the world to the next. Okay, so question number one from feedback yesterday um, was about if we have a duck superclass and a rubber duck subclass, why would you do duck D1 equals new rubber duck? So, okay, Mr. So Schultz, throw in your info. Uh, I have an example that I use in my class. Um, one of the labs that we do towards the end of the year is we program a specific board game and it's a two player game so that uh, we set it up so that it can be played human versus human, human versus computer or computer versus computer. But in order to be able to do that, we want each player to be able to move regardless of whether the player is a human or a computer. So imagine a hierarchy where we have a generic player class at the top that has a move method. And then below that in the hierarchy, we have a human player that extends the generic player, but overrides the move method. And inside that move method, we put a prompt on the screen. We ask the user to type the location, you know, uh, the location that they're moving to. They, they enter the location um, through the keyboard and we collect the location that way. Also below the generic player is a computer player. And it also has a move method that's overridden, but instead of going to the, the, the screen and, and prompting the user to enter something, the computer just generates a random location. It generates a random number. But either way then, that way, both the human and the computer can generate a location that they want to move to, okay? So inside the code, it would look something like this. You know, we want to be able to have player one move regardless. So by creating a generic player P1, we don't actually construct an object to go with it yet. Instead, we ask the user if P1 is going to be human or computer. And then based on the user's choice, we have the flexibility to say, okay, we're going to make P P1 a new human player because a human player is an extension of generic player. Or we can say, okay, we're going to make P1 a computer player because computer player is an extension of a generic player. And at that point, it doesn't matter whether I have a human player or a computer player, they both override the move method in the generic player, which means they, they can both move, but I have the flexibility to, to use our polymorphism. You know, polymorphism is when we use, uh, when we can treat different things the same. I can tell player one to move, whether player one is a human player or a computer player, they're both generic players, which means they both have the behavior of a generic player. They just implement that move method differently. So this would be an example where that might be useful to do that. And in my class today, we revisited the same topic and I pulled out some code from last year at this time that was the dog class with um, a Basset Hound breed and a mixed breed. Um, and you can imagine that, you know, Bo's the Basset Hound and JJ's the mixed breed. Um, and I have added that to the day six folder with inheritance case studies in the resources. Um, we looked at how this functions as well. And we made, you know, some dog bow as a new Basset Hound. And when that happened, we noticed that it first constructs and calls the constructor of the dog object. So from the left side, and then it calls the constructor for the subclass from the right side. So we noticed some things about that code. So you've got that now. So you can go back this afternoon or tonight or tomorrow and kind of um, build some more objects. Those are small projects. Um, and we, I'm gonna have another implementation to, to recommend to you with either your duck class case study or your dog's case study. Um, and then of course you also have the animal project. So. Um, Whatever part of the zoo you want to travel to or the petting <laughs> zoo, um, we got you covered here in CSA. Okay. All right. Next question. I'm wondering if you're able to do some highlighting when you're taking the online exams. 
So yeah, I had a, I had a, I, I'm wondering about this one because if you're taking the online exam, the questions are going to be on the screen. So I don't believe there's a highlighter tool built into the online exam software. Um, for so the first suggestion I would have is make sure that you're doing the practice digital exam, and that way you know what tools are there available. I know there's a button you can click that'll give you the the um, the quick reference guide and, yeah, and some Java things like reference. that. But I don't believe, I, I know I've seen testing environments in the past that you can click a button and it'll bring up a little highlighter, but I don't believe that's part of the testing, the, the digital testing environment for the AP exam. Yeah, and that would be camera, something you'd have to experiment with. Your camera will have to be on the entire time. That's part of the bandwidth back and forth. So there, there could very well be some parameters around, yeah. you know, what you're able to have out and at your desk because, you know, all of that is... Part but I thought this was also a good question for those taking the paper pencil exam. So I went online and I found this and I pulled this directly from the AP student page. These are things that you should not bring with you to the AP exam. So any electronic equipment, including phones, smartwatches, fitness trackers, any kind of wearable technology, um, cameras, recording, listening devices, anything like that. Um, the only exceptions to these would be laptops, obviously, that, that you're using for in-school digital testing or, or things that are specific to a specific exam. Um, don't bring any books. Don't bring reference guides. Don't bring notes, any of anything like that. It does specifically say in here, pencils that are not number two, correction fluid dictionaries, highlighters, or colored pencils. So don't bring any of that with you. Um, don't bring your own scratch paper. Um, students testing in school are prohibited from bringing their own scratch paper, but scratch paper will be provided for you. Um, please don't bring any watches or, or anything that beep or make noise or have alarms. Um, no computers or calculators that aren't approved, you know, reference guides, earplugs. Um, don't wear clothing that has a list of all of the, I, I have a t-shirt that I picked up at a programming contest that says, I know how to, how to say hello in eight different languages. And it lists hello world in like eight different programming languages. So anything like that, that has computer code written on it would be off limits. Um, don't bring food or drink. Don't bring clipboards. So, so this is the list. And again, this is out on um, uh, AP Central. I believe it's on the AP students page. Um, don't bring or, your Java quick reference. You'll be provided yeah, one. So yeah, one will be given. You to need you. to have one that you're working with until your exam time, but you don't need to bring it with you. Yeah. That's okay. And I think we've got one more. List. Yes. So um, just to refresh, um, this was added today, a question. Um, why haven't we talked about these and, and whatever? Um, you are not required any longer after version 2019 of the course and exam description. You do not have to be assessed and you will not be assessed about abstract classes, interface implementation, number conversion of any type, binary, octal, decimal. Um, so what did I say? Binary, octal, hexadecimal. Um, so you're not gonna have to convert numbers. Um, so, you know, these, you, it's great if you know them. It's great if you use them. You will not see them on your AP exam yeah. any longer. Okay. Those That's are all our there questions about that. for the day. There we go. Okay. So talking again quickly about your ducks, your rubber ducks, and your mallards, and we could morph this out to our dogs, basset hounds, and mixed breeds. And if you have a dog, make another class. Um, of whatever breed dog you have and work on a dog case study. But I found um, in my, my box of um, CS little gadgets, um, a whole bunch of different rubber ducks. So my point with this is I have eight ducks lined up. You know, I think this one's a lamb. Um, this one's our um, unicorn. There we go. Make it a little bigger. Even bigger. Nice. Yeah. Um, you know, our study or duck, this is what you all need to be for the next bit. Um, you know, our tiger duck for my alma mater. Um, so um, if you create an array list of eight duck objects or eight dog objects or eight whatever TV show you love or eight whatever cartoon you grew up loving, um, if you create an array list of eight items, you're going to be able to practice every search and sort that we talk about today. And you're going to be able to replicate what you see Mr. Schultz show you graphically on the page um, with an array list of that type. So in order to practice today's work, um, you could create a pretty simple eight element, eight object array list and then go back and rewatch today's um, teaching demonstration 
and work back through it your own self. So I want to inspire you with that on the front end instead of it be like, why didn't they tell us that? Um, um, just kind of plan ahead. You know, you've got the code in our resources folder. We'll give you the link to that at the end. Um, how to get to rubber ducks. You may have a Raylist code that your teachers worked with you all year with. So um, whatever you have, um, it doesn't have to be an 8,000 you know, item list. It can be a short list and um, packs a lot of punch. The other thing I wanted to tell you today, because we're getting ready to rock and roll and it's going to be good, um, is you need to have today, I think, my recommendation is that you have paper pencil, and that you have maybe your phone out so that you can take some pictures if you want to take some pictures of some of these slides. Now, I know that you all can rewatch this, but you may just want to not rewatch it and, and grab it, you know, the first couple times. Um, we're going to be going over the searches and sorts that are tested in CSA. These are not all the searches and sorts that, that computer scientists do, but these are the five that you're responsible to know and know how to use and know how to 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 work with. I'm going to revisit algorithms for arrays and um, you'll see for loops and enhanced for loop work. And then we're going to finally get to delimiter. So it's kind of a busy day. We're not doing multiple choice today because we have other things, um, but we will do some recursion tomorrow and the multiple choice tomorrow will be recursion questions. So you can look forward to that. Here are the um, skills that we're focusing on today. Um, we're down to 3D uh, in terms of the free response column three skill. And then we're going to look at mul not multiple choice, but the, um, the pieces of search and sort hit at 2C, 4B, and 5B. So get my, get my words coming out correctly. <laughs> so here we go. Okay. So the search and sorts for are your bit of the day. This is going to be our longest bit of the day. This is also really content review. So um, if we had this thing, we'd probably need to get into hexadecimal today to cover all these bits that we're going to cover. Um, we're going to need more than we're going to need more than than a flip calculator um, for what we're covering today. Um, but from con two in the course and exam. We will have to know how to search things and how to sort things. So I want to go all the way back to the beginning. When we search for something, it's kind of like I lost my earring. I've got to search for it. You know, I'm going to tear my house apart looking for my lost earring. Um, we're looking for something. So that's the definition of search. And when we are searching for something, we're going to be searching a list or a data set. So it could be a list, um, an array list or a 1D array or 2D array, we can search for something based on a criteria that we give the computer code. So that's kind of what search means. Now let's talk a little bit about sort and what a sort is. So a sort can take on a few different shapes. You may help at home with doing the laundry and you may do kind of what you're seeing happen here. Um, like things by color, are being sorted into baskets by color. So sometimes we wanna group things by category and that's kind of what's happening with these items. We wanna move them, we wanna group them together. Um, sorting can also put things in an order either numerically or alphabetically, can put them in an order in two different ways. So on the next um, reminder, I want to kind of just kind of revisit A to Z means ascending. So think about I'm going up a flight of steps. We call that ascending a flight of stairs. So you're going from lowest to highest and that happens to be A to Z. So that might be numbers ascending or it could be alphabet ascending. Descending is coming down the flight of stairs or going from Z to A. And you probably use a lot of software tools that have these buttons already built in at the top. So um, so those kind of help you, but you kind of want to connect that to the word descending and the word ascending. It might be given to you in that format in the free response you know, scenario that's given to you. You just want to be prepared for that language. So here is a nice list of the five searches and sorts that you need to be kind of an expert at. Um, so Maggie's telling you take a photo. Um, you can come back and do that or you can do it now. And we're going to unpack and show you a demonstration of all of these. So this is kind of what I'm talking about with our, 
our list of eight ducks, um, our array of eight ducks or eight dogs or eight whatever you want them to be. It could be eight snacks, um, your favorite eight things to, to snack on, whatever you want to do, eight numbers, anything. Um, you can apply each of these to even a small data set and see them move. And that's what you're going to see today. So what we're going to do is show you an example, starting with sequential linear search. And then we're going to summarize the, the key points about each of those. So um, after you see the search happen or the sort happen, there's going to be a summary slide where we kind of pull it all together. And so, I would I would love to have the time to go through the code in detail for each one of these, but you could probably take a 45 minute session on each one of these specific topics if you really wanted to break the code down. And unfortunately, we just don't have time. And you can that. find the code all over the Internet, um, yeah. sadly. And, and I guess a good thing. It's a good and a bad. Um, so, so we're just focusing on the algorithm and how the algorithm works. We're going to demonstrate it, but we're not going to be able to look at the code. That's okay? why so you, you might may want to apply your it to your small list of eight. So we, um, we brought in some guests for, for our favorite things. Our favorite things are the AP Daily Teachers. So we are going to be using the AP Daily Teachers for our searching and sorting. We just thought that was going to be so much fun. You guys are probably at home going, yeah, okay, it's just the AP Daily Teachers. But to us, this is really exciting. This is fun seeing all of these faces again. Okay. So for our demonstration of linear search, linear search, my opinion, is probably the easiest most basic to implement because really a, a linear search or a sequential search, um, both names kind of mean the same thing. All we're doing is just traversing the array. And this is one of the algorithms that Mrs. Westerland, um, we spoke about um, last Wednesday, and we're going to recap again today. We'll review a little bit, you know, all of the different algorithms that go along with array traversal. One of them is traversing an array or an array list to find something specific. So let's say that I'm searching for Gallagher. Okay, well, for our array traversal, we're going to start at the very beginning. We're going to traverse the list. We're going to start with Mrs. Miller. And as we work through the list, Miller is not equal to Gallagher, so we continue. And Chaika is not equal to Gallagher, so we continue. And Schultz is not equal to Gallagher, so we continue. Every time we look through uh, at the next element in our, in our list, whether it be an array or an array list, we do a, a simple comparison. Um, in this case, we would have to use dot equals because we're comparing strings. Um, Hendrickson is not equal to Gallagher. Um, Ideoji is not equal to Gallagher. Westerland is not e equal to Gallagher. But then we finally hit Mr. Gallagher. And Mr. Gallagher is equal to Gallagher. So we would return six as our index position, the location of Mr. Gallagher. If by some chance we were searching for something that's not in the list, we would continue to traverse all the way to the end. And if we traverse the entire array or array list and we don't find what we're looking for, typically the rule of thumb is we would return negative one. And negative one is kind of the, the, the de facto universal indicator that whatever it was we were searching for isn't there. So that is our first demonstration. That's our linear search. So linear search, sequential search, you are very familiar with because you probably use control F almost daily. Um, that's really what it's doing. It's taking a PDF document or the chapter of your history book or whatever it is that we've pulled up and we hit control F and we want it to find the next occurrence of whatever word it is that we're searching for. Um, so just remember that's what it does. And it, it, it literally just looks through and says, I found it. Um, look by element by element, find the criteria. It can be fast if the data set is short and what you're looking for is near the front. If the data set's huge and what you're looking for is near the front, it can be short. Um, you can imagine if you had, you know, an 800 page document and there was one occurrence of this word that I'm looking for on the 799th page, not going to be super fast, but fast in terms of computing time is relative, I believe. Um, we don't tend to have to wait very long for what we're looking for. So, and here are some, what do you want to say, Mr. Zoltz? Oh, I was just going to say um, another, in sort, uh, another important piece of a sequential search is that it works whether the data set is sorted or unsorted. Yeah. We don't have to have a sorted data set. Yeah. which we'll talk about again in a second. Yeah, some of them do. Um, and here are two AP Daily videos where um, Mr. Hendrickson, Hendrick, Hendrickson and Gallagher go over these. I guess I'll just call them Cody and Tim. I can say that <laughs> so easy. Um, so um, watch Cody and Tim talk about these in a little more detail. Um, this is, I would think, the most common that of the 
the five that you have to know, you use it the most in your everyday life when you do control F probably. And um, this is one that you could see pop up on a free response. You know, you might have to search by criteria for an item. It's one of the algorithms you must know. And like I said, it's probably the easiest to implement or, or the, the least complicated, I should say, to implement. Um, but as Mrs. Westerland just said, it's not always going to be the fastest. It could be, depending on where the element is we're looking for. But typically, in a general sense, it's not going to be the fastest. It would only be the fastest if, if what we're looking for happens to be at the, at, at the front end of the list that we're searching. So, yeah. Okay, next one. Um, next one up is binary search. Okay, now I want you to notice this time the list is in sorted order um, because for binary search, our data has to be sorted. The idea behind binary search is that we're going to look at the middle. So, um, you know, back in the old days, kids, um, we used to have these things called phone books. And if we wanted to look up a phone number, we actually had to get a book out of the drawer and look through, and it would have taken forever to do a sequential search. But if we open the book to the middle, we could figure out if the, the person's name we were looking for came in the first half of the book or the second half of the book. And then we would open that, you know, whichever half, we would just keep breaking it down by half. So it made for a very quick way to search. And that's an example of a binary search. With a binary search, we start with an entire list. We identify the lowest index position that we want to search and the highest index position that we want to search. And then we find the middle. So in this case, seven plus zero divided by two. Remember, uh, in, in Java, integer divided by integer gives us an integer. We're going to be looking at the middle position is Mr. Henriksen. Cody. Hi, Cody. Um, so if I'm looking for Gallagher again, we can say that alphabetically Gallagher comes before Henriksen. So that means that I can ignore everything from our middle position on up, and we're going to reset our high index position to one less than the value we just looked at. So now with one search, I've eliminated over half of my list. So now I've only got three elements that I need to look at. So again, we're going to look at our low position and our high position. We're going to calculate the middle. Two plus zero divided by two gives us one. So Mrs. Chaika is now our middle position, and we're going to compare Gallagher to Chaika. Well, because Gallagher comes alphabetically after Chaika, that means we can eliminate everything from Chaika forward in our list. And we're going to set low equal to mid plus one. So now notice that our low position and our high position are equal to each other. We're going to repeat the algorithm. We're going to go through and find the middle. So two plus two divided by two equals two. So now index position two is all three of those pointers. Um, it's our high position, our low position, and our middle. And because Gallagher is equal to Gallagher, we're going to return index position two. So we found Mr. Gallagher again in index position two. Okay, now Maggie chimes in at this point and says, but what if we're searching for something that isn't in the list? If it's a sequential search, we're just going to go all the way to the end. And if we don't find it, we don't find it. But how does that work with a binary search? Well, let's back up one step and let's imagine that instead of searching for Gallagher, we're searching for Garfield. And we just got to the point where high and low and mid were all equal to index position two. Well, Garfield comes after Gallagher. So we're going to set low equal to mid plus one. So we've just eliminated everything from Mr. Gallagher forward. We're setting our low position equal to three, which is where Henriksen is, but we've already eliminated Mr. Henriksen. And look at what's going on here. Our low position is now greater than our high position. So when, when our low value, our low index position becomes greater than the high index position, when those boundaries cross, that's our sign that we've missed, that we've passed the place where it would be if it was there and it's not there. So we can return negative one at that point because we can say very safely that Garfield is not in our list of AP Daily teachers. So when you look at binary search algorithms, watch for that um, structure in the code that allows for the checking for when it's not in the list, what does it return? So here are the high points of binary search. This is your second kind of summary slide that you may want to grab a photograph of with your phone. Um, binary search requires a sorted list. It can be ascending or descending. Checks the midpoint of the array first. Um, our analogies to everyday life are a phone book, a dictionary, a file cabinet, um, you know, anything that's in A to Z order, Z to A order, um, numeric order, you know, so anything like that. Um, this is more efficient um, because it, it, you know, kind of chunks the list and, and gets at what it's looking for. So we have two AP Daily videos that cover this exact topic. Um, one with yours truly, Mr. Schultz, our resident expert, and then a faculty lecture from Brianna Morrison. 
And the one other thing I wanted to point out with this, it wouldn't be uncommon to get a multiple choice question, maybe about binary search, where they show you the code and say something like, um, you know, all of the different things we've looked at before, the different wording of the questions. You know, in this case, you're looking at the code for binary search, but it doesn't work as expected. What, what could be going wrong with the code? Or looking at uh, this implementation of binary search that does work as expected, how many searches would be required if we have, you know, 50 even values in order um, to find the value 25? Oh, yeah, how many okay, passes? So, or 26. That's a very common question. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you think about that, you know, if I'm looking for a specific value, if I start with 100 values, let's say, well, the first pass through, I'm going to eliminate half. So now I have 50. And then the second pass through, I'm going to eliminate half of that. So I've only got 25 left. So the maximum so number it would take, I, I could keep just dividing by two until I get one value left. And that would be the number of passes through the loop I would need um, to figure out how many how many iterations through my search to find the value that I'm looking for or determine that it's not there. Okay. So, so think about that. If every time I, every time I do a comparison um, with that middle, I eliminate half of my list. Think about how, how many, how many comparisons would, would be required if I start with a list of a million elements or, you know, 500,000 elements, different things like that. Okay. So those are the two searching algorithms um, that are part of the AP subset. So now let's shift gears and let's look at sorting algorithms. Okay. Now, again, um, I wish we had time that we could show the code and kind of break the code down for these, but we simply don't have time to do that. So we're going to focus on how the algorithm works. And that's really probably the most important thing, in my opinion, um, if you had to choose between either knowing the code or knowing what it does and how it works. I would say my opinion would be that it's more important to know the differences between them and how they work, because then you can kind of trace through the algorithm if you're picturing um, and you can kind of figure figure out the answers to the questions you're looking for. Um, I guess I'm, I'm I guess yeah. I'm saying that. OK, yeah. um, but the idea of selection sort with selection sort, we're going to start at index. Uh, we're going to start this loop control variable at index position zero. So we're going to start with Mrs. Miller. OK, and then the idea of selection sort is that we're going to we're going to traverse through the rest of the list, either array or array list, and we're going to find whichever value is the smallest. And in this case, we're talking the smallest alphabetically, whichever one is the lowest in the alphabet. So as we work our way through, you know, Miller comes before Mitchell. So Miller would be considered the lowest. Miller comes before Schultz. Miller comes before Westerland. But then we get up here. IDOG alphabetically comes before Miller. So IDOG is now considered our, our lowest value. Um, IDOG comes before Hendrickson. IDOG comes before Gallagher, IDOG comes before Chaika. So by the time we pass through, we're looking for the smallest value in the list starting with index position I. We've identified that IDOG is the minimum value. So after we've traversed through the entire thing and we've established, established that IDOG is the, the smallest value or the first alphabetic value, we're going to go through and we're going to swap the value at index position I with whatever that minimum value is. So right off the bat, we take Miller and IDOG and they trade places. And then we're going to continue to traverse through. So we're going to increment I to the next index position, and we're going to repeat that process all over again. We're going to traverse from index position one all the way to the end, and we're going to look for whatever the lowest alphabetical value is. And in this case, we're going to end up down on the end in position seven with Chaika. Chaika is C, C comes before any of the others. And we're not worried about things that come before our index position I. We've already sorted IDOG. So we're going to make sure as we look through for the smallest value, we're going to start our for loop that's going to go through this at position I. We don't want to go before that. OK, so now we're going to find the smallest value in the list starting with index position I. We've identified Chaika. And as soon as I go through and I identify that smallest value, we swap the value at position I with our minimum value. And we're going to keep that process going. We're going to index our um, index, I'm sorry, increment I to the next index position. We'll start at I, work our way up and find the lowest value. In this case, the next one is going to be Gallagher. So we'll swap Schultz and Gallagher. And so you can kind of see where this gets the name selection sort. Every time I increment I to the next position, I'm going to work from that position up and I'm going to select whatever the value is that I'm looking for. If we're, if we're going in ascending order, we're going to be looking for the smallest value. If we're going in descending order, then we're going to be looking for the biggest value. But in this case, because we're sorting in ascending order, we're going to be looking for the smallest value we can find from the index position I up. So in this case, the, the smallest the, the, the smallest value of the remaining um, AP daily teachers is going to be H for Henriksen. So we'll swap Westerlund and Henriksen. OK, we'll increment up to Miller. Now watch what happens with this one. This is kind of interesting. So we're going to work our way up. But notice that Miller is the minimum value of all of the values that are remaining. So in this case, Miller is both 
the index position i and the minimum value. So we're still going to do the swap, but in this case, we're kind of swapping position four with position four. So it's going to end up being the same as just kind of leaving Mrs. Miller right where she is. Um, we'll increment I up to the next position. So we'll, we'll have Mrs. Westerlin. Hi there. Hi. Um, we'll find the smallest value in the list starting with index position I. And in this case, it's going to be Dr. Mitchell. Um, and because Mitchell and Westerlin need to swap, they will trade places. Um, we'll work our way up to Schultz. So I is the next index position. We'll find the smallest value. And in this case, Schultz comes before Westerlin. So Schultz ends up swapping with himself. And then once we get to the last index position, there's nothing left. So we don't really end up needing to traverse beyond that. So once we get to the point that we've hit, um, hit that spot, we can stop. Um, we've got everything sorted. So now you can see that we've got our, our AP Daily teachers in ascending order from IDOG all the way to Westerland. Nice. And it, it's a number of passes for this one, but this works a lot like our human brain works, obviously, exactly, really, to alphabetize an item. And that's another reason why I'm telling you an, a short list of eight elements is probably a good one for you to, to work through this on because you can do it in your head and also follow the Java code. Um, so this is used to sort something alphabetically or numerically in ascending or descending order. Um, it does use a nested loop structure. I, I'm sure you could do it other ways. This is the typical structure. Hit one more time. The oh, yeah. outer loop um, works for the full length and the inner loop, you know, obviously um, works fully for each outer loop um, and it does require many passes so for a large data set this one's going to take a little while um, you know it isn't necessarily considered the fastest but it gets the job done um, this one's pretty logical you could see this one in a free response as well i think the horse barn we've talked about that a few times mm -hmm. i think horse barn um, and that's on the list that i have in the resources folder you can figure i think it's 2014 um, you can do selection sort to accomplish the horse barn question. Um, you know, so um, that's one that comes to mind. Um, and again, um, Morrison and, and Henri Henriksen um, have lecture videos about this. So you can go back yeah. and review it on AP Daily. And, and the one thing we probably need to mention as far as the, the searching algorithms and sorting algorithms, I, I am yet to see a free response question where it specifically says implement selection sort or no, implement insertion right. sort. Um, but you're absolutely right when you say that free response questions and, and you know, you will see selection sort, insertion sort specifically mentioned from time to time in multiple choice questions. But in free response, um, Mrs. Westerlin is 100% correct when she says that you'll see aspects of each of these, you know, some of the concepts of selection selection sort or insertion sort. Like, I think in, in the horses, you have to put the horses in the stalls according to their, their name alphabetically. Yeah. Am I right? Uh -huh. So like if Annie is a horse and um, Charlie is a horse and, you know, Dylan is a horse or something, they would be in stall one, stall two, stall three or something. I think that's yeah. the premise. Um, and, and that and can I... be accomplished with this type of a method. Yeah, and I know the other thing about horse barn, which is going to kind of lead us into insertion sort, there's a specific part of that problem where you have empty stalls. So you have to kind of slide the horses down to fill all of the empty stalls, which which is kind of also um, the, the premise of insertion sort. So Segway again, there, right on into there the are next aspects of each of these that kind of pop in here. So now let's look at insertion sort. Um, so this is where it's important to kind of keep in mind the difference between selection sort and insertion sort, because there, there are some pretty big differences. With, with selection sort, we started at index position zero and then selected the minimum value from behind it. Insertion sort, we're going to start the in, um, start I, our, our index position that we're starting with at position one, and then we're going to compare forward, not backwards. So um, we're going to pretend our algorithm, as far as our algorithm is concerned, the algorithm only is concerned with things that fall in front in our array or array list of our index position i. As far as our algorithm is concerned, anything at this point after position one doesn't exist. Okay, so we're only going to focus on things one and before. So to start, um, we're going to take whatever whatever value is at position one and copy it over to this temporary variables for safekeeping. So we're going to put Mrs. Shika kind of down in timeout just to keep her safe, okay? Because we're going to do some other things up here in the list. She would probably love being put in timeout this time of year. <laughs> Can it be at the beach? Can my timeout yeah, be at go. the beach? So now that we've done that, 
we're going to look in front of position I and we're going to kind of work our way backwards and we're going to move each element up until we either find a value that's less than temp. In other words, in our case, a, a value that comes alphabetically before Shika, or we arrive at index position zero. So as we look, Miller does not, uh, Miller is not less than Chika. Okay, Miller alphabetically does not come before Chika, um, and we are not at index position zero. So we're going to slide Miller up one slot. But now we have arrived at index position zero, which means we have to stop. We can't go any further because if I try and go any further, we're going to throw an index out of bounds exception. And this kind of goes back to the question um, that we had several days ago where somebody was asking, do I have to know all of the index out of bounds exceptions and that kind of stuff? So again, this would be one of those cases that we have to know that we're going to stop at that point. Otherwise, we go out of bounds and everything crashes. So now that we've stopped, we're going to insert temp at whatever our open index position is. And that's where we get the name insertion sort. We're going to insert Chika back up here at index position zero um, because we created a hole that we need to fill. Okay. After we do that, we're going to iterate back up and we're going to increment I to the next index position. So now we're looking at Schultz. So now I get to go to timeout. I'm down on the beach. Okay. So we're going to copy Schultz down to uh, from position I to this temporary variable. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to move each element up until we find a value that's less than temp or we arrive at index position zero. So right off the bat, you can kind of picture this as a while loop that's starting to run. But right off the bat, we find that Miller alphabetically is less than Schultz. Okay, so I can stop at that point. I don't even go into this loop. We're automatically just going to insert Schultz, at, uh, you know, whatever the value is in temp into this open index position. So you we barely got your toes in the sand. Right back where it belongs. Yeah, I wasn't on the beach long. <laughs> Bare, barely enough to get a burn. There you go. Okay, let's so see let's see. What happens with Cody? We're going to increment I to the next in index position. We'll copy Cody down to the beach. Um, and then as we work our way down, uh, Schultz does not come alphabetically before Hendrickson. So we're going to assign, you know, we're going to increment Schultz up or slide Schultz up one. Miller does not come before Hendrickson. So we're going to slide Miller up one, but Chika does come before Hendrickson. So that's our signal to stop. And we now have this open position at position one where we can insert Hendrickson back in. So we're going to insert temp back to the open position. So every time I increment I to the next index position, you know, we add on, you know, all of these values are, are in the array or array list. But again, as far as our, um, as far as our algorithm is concerned, the only things that matter are, in, are the, are the values that are in front of position I. So let's see, we've got uh, Mrs. IDOG. We'll copy the value at position I to our temporary variable. Um, Schultz does not alphabetically come before IDOG. So we'll slide Schultz up. Uh, Miller does not come alphabetically before IDOG. Henriksen does not come before IDOG. And Chika uh, does not come before IDOG. So now we get to this point where we arrive at index position zero. So that's our second stop case. And because we've hit zero, that's automatically going to be a stop, even though there's nothing, nothing, uh, uh, there's no name to compare to. And we're going to insert IDOG into position zero. All right, and we'll keep working our way up. So now we've got Mrs. Westerlin. You get to enjoy the beach. That's right. For okay. a while. But right off the bat, we see that Schultz alphabetically does come before Westerlin. So I that's as far off. as we need to go. Not the shortest <laughs> trip of anybody. <laughs> so so you get popped right back up into that open index the position. False alarm. We're going to increment I again to Mr. Gallagher. Uh, we'll copy Mr. Gallagher down to um, our temporary variable. And because Westerlin comes alphabetically after, Schultz comes alphabetically after, Miller comes alphabetically after, and Henriksen comes alphabetically after. We work our way down until we find Chika, who is our first value that comes before Gallagher out, uh, alphabetically. So we're going to insert uh, Mr. Gallagher into index position two. And then finally, we get to Dr. Mitchell. We're going to copy Dr. Mitchell down to position, uh, let's see, from position I to our temporary variable. And then just as we have in the past, we're going to continue to work our way down. So um, so we need to move Westerland up. We need to move Schultz up. And then we find Mrs. Miller that alphabetically comes before Mitchell. So that's our signal to stop. And we copy Mrs. Mitchell into index position five. So we have now sorted our list by inserting each person into the space that they belong. Nice. And this is also exactly how our brains would file. This is very similar to a file cabinet, you know, moving the file, but you're using that temp variable so that you don't destroy your data set. Um, so it does insertion. So the, the nested, the nested uh, iteration here is typically an outer for loop and an inner while loop, but there could be other implementations. Um, many passes, as you can see over the data set um, and Again, we have two AP 
daily videos that cover this specific topic um, again. So um, it's a different way to sort than selection, but they both get to the same point. You know, they're, they're reordering the data set in ascending or descending um, in two different algorithmic fashions. Okay, and that brings us to, to our last one. Now, this one's a little different than the others. Um, when, we, when we did the recap of insertion sort and selection sort, you noticed there were loops involved. This one is more of a recursive. In fact, it's not more of a recursive. This is a recursive algorithm. And we forgot to mention that back several slides ago when we were talking about binary search. Binary search um, is kind of like merge sort. Both of them, binary search and merge sort, are um, what are considered divide and conquer algorithms. We're going to break things in half and break things in half, break things in half. Binary search could be um, implemented iteratively with loops, or it could be implemented recursively. Merge sort is a recursive algorithm, okay? So our mantra for merge sort is going to be left, right, merge. Left, right, merge. Left, right, merge. I hope you're saying it at home with me. Left, right, merge. So Write what I'm going to do is anytime I have a list, I'm going to break that lifted list in half, and I'm going to recursively call my algorithm with the left-hand side. So now my list consists of just those first four elements on the left. But again, because I'm calling the merge sort algorithm, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my list, which is now limited to just those four elements, and I'm going to recursively call it with just the left half. So now my list at this level of iteration, and we'll talk more about recursion tomorrow, but my, uh, my left-hand side becomes my complete list. So recursively, I'm going to call recall my merge sort algorithm with just the left-hand side. And we're gonna to continue to do that until we hit the stopping case of just, we have one element in our list. So in this case, we've broken it down to the left as far as we can. Now we're ready for the right. So looking at this, this kind of breakdown of two elements, we've done left, we've done right, we have one element, so that's where we stop. And then we're gonna merge them back together. So when we merge, what we're doing is we're kind of thinking of it mentally as two separate little virtual lists I have my list on the left and I have my list on the right. And we're gonna compare the elements to see which comes out algebra, um, algebraically, alphabetically first. And that's the one that's gonna move into this first position. So because Chaika comes before Miller, we're gonna put Chaika back in this position. And then Miller would be the only value left because we started with two. So we're gonna merge them back into those positions in the correct order. Okay, so now we're gonna back one level off the tree. You know, our little green line tells us that in comparing, you know, the left side of our, our first half and the, set, the right side, we've completed the left side. So now we're ready to do the right side, which means we have to start over again. I have a little sub list. We're going to call left. We're going to call right. And then I'm ready to merge them back together. So again, as I compare these, Henriksen comes alphabetically before Schultz. So I'm going to move Henriksen into position two. And because Schultz is the only element left, I'm going to move it into position three. Well, now notice I've got, you know, if I back up one level, I've got a left side completed and I've got a right side completed. So I'm ready to merge these two halves together. Okay. So now I'm going to compare again, if I'm looking at the left as kind of a virtual little list and I'm looking at the right side as its own virtual list, I'm going to compare the value at the beginning of each one. And because Chaika comes before Henriksen, Chaika gets moved first. So now I'm comparing Miller to Henriksen. And Henriksen comes before Miller, so Henriksen moves second. So I'm merging them back together again in order. Okay, I'm comparing Miller on the left to Schultz on the right, and Miller comes before Schultz. So we'll move Miller into position two, and because Schultz is the only element left, automatically I get dropped into position three. So we've now completed, of our original eight elements, we've completed the left-hand side by breaking it apart, breaking it apart, breaking it apart, and then merging the pieces back together again. So now that we've completed the left, we're going to deal with the right. Okay. And again, I now have a new call to merge sort, which means I have to call merge sort recursively with the left. And I immediately recall merge sort again with a call to the left. Um, and because IDOG only has one element, we've completed the left-hand side of this call. Now I'm going to call it with the right, which is Westerlund, and we have one element. So I've completed the left, I've completed the right, and now we're ready to merge these two elements back together again. And because IDOG comes before Westerlin, we'll merge IDOG first, and Western, Westerlin is our only remaining element, so Westerlin moves second. We've now completed the left half of our rightmost four, and I know it's confusing to keep mixing the left no, and the right. you're doing great. It's, okay. it's crystal clear. Okay, good. Um, so now that I've completed the left-hand side of this smaller little sublist, 
now I have to do the right side. And so I'm immediately going to call recursively call merge sort. Gallagher is one element. So we've completed the left side of this little list. Now we're going to do the right side with Dr. Mitchell. And because I've got the left and the right completed, I'm ready to merge these two back together. So Gallagher comes before Mitchell. And then because Mitchell is the one remaining element, she drops into place in position seven. So now notice I've got a left side completed. I've got a right side completed. So I'm ready to merge the two on the left with the two on the right. So I'm going to compare IDOG to Gallagher. IDOG comes first. And then I'm going to compare Gallagher on the right to Westerland on the left. Well, Gallagher comes first. So Gallagher is going to move into position five. Um, I'm going to compare Westerland and Mitchell. Well, Mitchell comes before Westerland. So I'm going to um, insert uh, Dr. Mitchell into position six. And then Westerland is our one remaining element. So uh, Mrs. Westerland is going to move into position seven. So now I've completed the right-hand side of my original eight elements. So now notice again, I've got a left-hand side completed, I've got a right-hand side completed, and we're all set to do our final merge. So I'm gonna compare Chaika on the left to IDOG on the right, and IDOG comes first. I got fancy with moving things around. Um, then I compare Chaika to Gallagher, and Chaika comes before Gallagher, so Mrs. Chaika is gonna go next. And then I'm gonna compare Henriksen to Gallagher. Well, Gallagher comes before Henriksen, Henriksen comes before Mitchell. Miller comes before Mitchell. Mitchell comes before Schultz. Schultz comes before uh, Westerland. And Westerland, last but definitely not least, the caboose. drops into position seven. So we have now sorted train using CSA. merge sort. So yeah, this is, it's like a little party train. I love it. So this is what I'm telling you, be inspired to make your own ducks, your own dogs, your own whatevers, and work through these algorithms so that you understand conceptually and actually what's happening and then study the Java code so that you're familiar with what it looks like. Because this particular algorithm sort, you're gonna see only in multiple choice. You're certainly not gonna have to write this code um, in a free response. Oh my gosh, it's 547 already. Oh goodness, wow. y'all. So let's okay. review merge sort quickly. Um, as Mr. Schultz said, multiple passes, it splits, it is recursive, it's divide and conquer. Um, Mr. Schultz has made two videos on AP Daily um, in unit 10 that you can watch with this. Um, we'll talk about recursion tomorrow. So if that's still a little fuzzy, um, hopefully it'll get clearer um, in 23 hours. Okay, let's see what else we can do. We do not have time to really go through these, but take a photo oh, no, of this. We're okay. Bit. We'll, we'll we go okay? a little long. Yeah, we're okay. okay. We'll go a little long. That's okay. Okay. So it's good stuff. The 12 algorithms here, you must know. You must know how to write these. You must know how to recognize these. You must know how to fill in missing code. All the things we've talked about for all these days. Um, this is your toolbox that you've got to be good at using. So think about a carpenter you know and what they have to be good at. These, this is your toolbox. Um, these are your, you know, power tools here. Um, minimum and maximum value of a list. These would apply to a 1D array, 2D array, array list. Um, sum, average, or mode, mode being the most frequent in the, in the list. Um, one element has at least one particular property. That's a lot like what you saw with sequential or linear search. I want to look for the word, you know, Schultz in this you know, 500 page book. Um, determine if all elements have a particular property. So we're looking for if all of them are even numbers, if all of them are odd numbers, if all of them begin with the letter A. Um, consecutive pairs, you know, are there are there two things together that, that have a, the same particular property? Presence or absence of duplicates. Um, determine the number of elements that meet a specific criteria. And back up to presence or absence of duplicates. That's one of those algorithms. And really, you would have to do this with the pairs, too, where you've got to look at I and then I plus one. So when you're looking at, you know, where you've got to look at two things that are side by side in a, a list of things, um, think about how you look at both of those, you know, I'm going to look at this one and then the very next one. Um, you're not just iterating through them individually, but you're looking at them in, in, in sets. Um, any, anything you want to add to that, Mr. Schultz? Um, 
And then nope, from the just, right hand side, shifting yeah. or rotating and reversing the order that really gets us into some of these sorts and that you've just seen um, yes. when you're going to shift and rotate things left and right and completely reverse the order of something, you're going to need a little bit more than than the left hand column from con two. this is con two I one teachers you can use ap classroom to extract multiple choice questions based on uh, learning objectives so you could go in there and choose by learning objective item and just pull multiple choice questions from this particular um, ced you know like big idea unit here it's not really a a teaching unit one through 10, but it's a um, learning objective, con two, alphabet letter I, number one and number two. So um, this is your list of 12-ish um, that you must know. Here is our recap, grab a photo of this slide so that I don't have to talk you all the way through it. And we're gonna get to 2019 number three delimiters is um, gonna be our fast pass. Um, this is just kind of a summary slide. You've got to engage your pencil, your eyes, and your computer to really wrap your brain around these searches and sorts. And you do need to know all five of them. I mean, practice, you don't have practice, to know practice. others. Yeah. So yep. um, practice, you know, practice, practice. What is it? The five senses um, mm -hmm. engage at least three of them um, to get these down. Okay, here we go. Practice, practice, practice. Okay, because we are already a little short for time, I'm going to go through this a little quicker than normal. Um, but I do want to make sure to, to point out that I'm doing this a little differently. You know, normally I show you the scoring guidelines. Um, the scoring guidelines, um, I, I wanted to take a different approach this time. So this time, what I want you to kind of keep in mind as you do this is we're going to sketch out a solution, maybe a little pseudocode on the side. And this would be a place where maybe you could use your scrap paper on the test to start thinking about how you might... Um, you know, as you're looking at this question on the test, think about what the steps are going to be and then use those steps that you've written out as a roadmap to write the actual code. So looking at this one, um, you know, it says that many encoded strings contain delimiters and a delimiter is a non-empty string that acts as a boundary between different parts of a larger string. So you maybe you've heard of comma, uh, like a CSV file, a comma separated values file where commas are the delimiters or spaces are the delimiters or tabs are the delimiters. So they give us some examples and they tell us that in math, we do this all the time. We use parentheses as delimiters. So I can see that we've got parentheses around X plus Y, or I've got parentheses around the Y. Um, if you've ever done any HTML, um, if you've ever done, done any website design, we use delimiters there um, as um, hypertext. So we'll have a B that means we're turning on bold, and then we have a slash B that is the closed delimiter. So for what we're working on, um, we're going to have pairs of delimiters. There's always going to be an open delimiter and a closed delimiter. And our goal is to make sure that when we look at a string containing any type of delimiter, we keep it balanced. That's our overall goal for this. And as most of the questions do, we're given a, uh, a class definition. Um, our class definition includes two private instance variables. Both are strings. One is an identifier for our open delimiter and one is our closed delimiter. We have a constructor that is used to set the open delimiter and closed delimiter. And then we've got these two methods that we have to implement. We've got um, get delimiters where we're going to receive an array of tokens and then we have to create an array list. And then we also have this Boolean method is balanced where we receive an array list and we have to look through it and determine true or false whether or not it's balanced. In other words, whether there are the same number of open and closed delimiters and are they in the right order and is everything open and closed properly? Okay, so as we look at this, um, there's an example for part A. So it says for part A, we've got this string containing text and possibly de uh, delimiters has been split into tokens and stored in this array token. So we've got an example. Each token is either an open delimiter, a closed delimiter, or some substring that is not either type of delimiter. And we're going to write this method called get delimiter list, which returns an array list that contains all of the open and closed de delimiters in their, um, in their original order. So as we look at the example, we've identified our open delimiter as an open parenthesis, our closed delimiter as a closed parenthesis. Um, as we look through, our open delimiter is... Our first token is an open delimiter. We're going to ignore the second one because it's neither. We have a closed delimiter, and then we're going to ignore this one. So the array list that we return is going to be one open and one closed. And we have a second example down here where we've got Q and backslash Q. So as we look through, we grab the first one, we ignore the second one, we grab the third one, ignore ZZ, and we grab our last uh, closed delimiter. Okay. So as we think about how this is going to work, I have to create an array list. 
I have to loop to traverse through tokens. If a token is the same as either open or del open delimiter or closed delimiter, we're going to add the token to the array list. And then I have to return the array list. So those are basically the steps that I would write on my scratch paper as I'm kind of thinking logically about what this algorithm is going to look like that I need to do to make part A do what it's supposed to do. And now that I've got this little roadmap, I can come over and I can start writing my actual code. So as you practice these, make sure you're practicing in the sheet um, that you're going to be given on the test. Make sure you're using the answer sheet. But I would write the header as given. I'm going to create the array list. So array list strings, my delimiter list equals new array list strings. I'm going to loop through to traverse tokens. Um, if my token at position i is equal to open delimiter or my token at position i is equal to close delimiter, I'm going to add that token to my delimiter list. And then I'm going to return my delimiter list. So sometimes writing down the pseudocode, as you're reading through, you can take little notes off of the side. It can save you a lot of time as you go through and you're actually trying to write the algorithm, because now all I have to do is just translate my pseudocode into actual code. And I also wanted to point out that you could also do the same solution with for each loops or enhanced for loops. It would just look like this. For every string token in tokens, if the token, and notice that I'm looking at specifically the token itself, if token equals open delimiter or token equals closed delimiter, I'm going to add token to my delimiter list and I'm still going to return. For part B, um, when traversing the array list from the first element to the last element, there's no point. Um, we we want to make sure everything's balanced. We want to make sure that at no point as I traverse through my array list that I just created, is there any point where there are more closed delimiters than open delimiters? And when I get to the end, the total number of open delimiters has to be equal to closed delimiters in order for them to be balanced. And again, we've got an example. So as you look at our first example, we have one open, zero close. We have two open, zero close. We have two open, one close three open, one close, three open, two close, three open, three close. So at no point as I was working through where there are more closed delimiters than open delimiters. And when I get to the very end, there's an equal number, they're balanced. If I look at the second example, I've got one open, one closed, uh, I'm sorry, one open, zero close, one open, one close. But then as soon as I hit this point, I have more closed than open, which means we're automatically out of balance at that point. And for the third example, I automatically start with a close. So that one's, um, that one's unbalanced from the start. Okay, so again, same idea. We're going to look at what I need to do this. First thing is I have to have a loop to traverse delimiters. If a delimiter is equal to open delimiter, we're going to add one to an open counter. Otherwise, we're going to add one to a closed counter, which means I have to have variables to keep track of my counters. So that's kind of a good clue that I have to create and initialize those variables. Um, if my close counter is ever, and this is inside the loop, if any point inside my loop close counter is greater than open counter, we can automatically return false because that means it's not balanced. And if after I finish the loop, my open counter equals close counter, we can return true. Otherwise, we return false. So again, now that I've got this roadmap that I kind of sketched out as I was reading through the problem, I can come over and I can start working on my code. So I'm going to put my header. I'm going to declare and initialize my variables. I'm going to create a loop that will loop through delimiters. Um, if str equals open delimiter, then we'll add one to my open counter. Otherwise, we'll add one to the close counter. If close counter is greater than open counter, uh, uh, open counter, we return false. And then if open counter equals close counter, return true, otherwise return false. So again, this is kind of a different approach. Um, it's an idea of actually creating pseudocodes that, that you can work through and again, use it as kind of like a blueprint or a roadmap as you go through and actually write your actual code on the answer sheet. Okay. All right. We went through that quick. There we go. That was nice. Um, and you all can go and pull up this question on AP Central and um, look at the canonical answer and work through it yourself. Um, you've got a little bit of time. So you have one more day to quack us back. If you have anything to tell us, um, we won't be checking the form after tomorrow because um, I don't even know if we'll have access to it. It'll probably just close out, actually. Um, so if you've got anything that you know, you're dying to know or um, some kind of whatever. Last um, chance to add your pen. That's to our right. Map. Last chance to say, you know, have a great day, Jill and Rob. Um, so here's what you need to take away from today. There are five searches and sorts that have been selected to be a part of the AP subset, and you need to engage with them to know them well. Um, you might see them in multiple choice, and you might could implement them or apply them to your own solution for free response. Um, we don't know of a case where it's been mandated. So um, you don't have to, to prepare for that. Um, tomorrow, we're going to talk about recursion, 2D array traversal. Um, I'm going to give you some information about endorsed providers. I've actually already put that in the College Board Resources folder, um, but I'm going to show you um, 
how you might can use some provider tools to help you, you know, have one last push. You've got, you know, what is it? Um, a, a week from tomorrow is yeah. the paper pencil exam. One so, week. so we're, um, you know, eight days away and our very best reminders. So um, here's some things that I put in the resources folder new today. You have the ducks case study, the animals case study. I added dogs today. Um, you have review labs there. There's the free response by question type. And I've put my vocabulary glossary page. It is not answered. You got to do the work. So you got to get the CED open and go through each of those learning objectives and essential knowledge statements and write down what it means or what it's about or what it involves. Um, I'm not going to give you any kind of filled out glossary. That is not Jill style. Um, you got to put your pencil to paper um, if you want to do that. So um, make your own note cards, whatever is your study style, um, you know, get busy with it. You got a week want to go. I wanted to add, I added something to the resource folder yesterday too. There was a question that came in yesterday about the doctor example I did in the hierarchy. So I did put that together with a little bit of a description and it's kind of a one pager that's out in the resource folder from yesterday if you needed to see that. So nice. All right. So sorry, we are so, so far one over minute time. Over. Sorry, we I held think you we're long. due for one minute over. Oh, have okay. a good night, yeah, everybody. Okay. Everybody have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.